Okay, so um, thanks a lot for coming on, everybody. Um, so my name's Tim Bell. I'm responsible for the infrastructure at the CERN Computer Center. Um, along with that, I've also uh, been, uh, have the honor of being elected as a member of the uh, OpenStack Management Board and uh, recently also uh, responsible for uh, getting the user committee uh, together. As Jonathan was so kind to post my email address up in the middle of the keynote, I've also added it here just for reference. But uh, if there is any one of the 1,300 people who hasn't sent me a mail, then please do so, because it's been really great to hear from you all. <laughs> so what is CERN? Um, CERN is the Conseil Européen de Recherche Nucléaire. So in English, it's the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. Um, we were founded in 1954, following the Second World War as a place where scientists from around the world could get together and work on fundamental research. The laboratory itself is situated between France and Switzerland on the border, straddled between the Lake of Geneva and the Jura Mountains. We have a very simple job, which is to work out how the universe works and what's it made of. So what do people come in and worry about? Um, the first thing they worry about is why we have mass. Um, this is a pretty important question, because if you don't have mass, you'd be zooming around at the speed of light. This is one area where we've made significant progress in the past 18 months. And in July, we were proud to announce that there's something there, almost certainly something called the Higgs boson, which is something that's been projected for the past 50 years. If this turns out to be correct, it will probably be the most significant scientific discovery since landing on the moon. Other things we think about, we've lost 96% of the universe. Um, we can account for 4% when we look out there by adding up the planets and stars. But when we look at how they're moving, we know that there is 96% of the mass of the universe that we can't account for at the moment. In addition to that, we're trying to work out why we're not half antimatter and half matter. The two, it's very good we're not, because they would instantly uh, just uh, decompose into a huge puff of energy. But there's no good explanation as to why, following the Big Bang, we aren't half mat matter and half antimatter. And then finally, trying to work out what was the universe like just after the Big Bang, before there were atoms, before there were protons. What was it that matter looked like? So how do we do that? We've got together about 10,000, 11,000 scientists from 100 different countries, and they're collaborating together to solve these problems. Um, the organization itself has a budget of around $1 billion a year, paid for by the 20 member states. Um, these are largely European-based countries. It's not exactly the same as the European Union, but uh, a lot of them are in common. And with that, roughly $1 to $2 per year is paid by the members of those countries towards the cost of the laboratory. So the current flagship experiment, there are lots of experiments that go on at CERN, but the, the flagship one is called the Large Hadron Collider. This is a 27-kilometer ring, 100 meters underground, across the border between France and Switzerland. It takes about 20 minutes to drive from one side to the other. The particles themselves in the uh, experiment go around 11,000 times a second, so they're just below the speed of light. Um, as you can see from the airport up the top there, it gives you a rough feeling of the kind of scale. So when you go 100 meters underground, what is there? Um, there is basically a tunnel like this. In that tunnel, there is a large pipe. And within that large pipe, there are two small pipes, about one centimeter across. They have a vacuum which is lower than the atmosphere on the moon. And they are chilled down to two degrees centigrade above absolute zero. So that's minus 273, sorry, 271 degrees centigrade. That's required in order that you can get magnets which are superconducting. So this means that using liquid helium, these magnets are able to sustain extremely high magnetic fields and bend round the particles that we send round through the, t the, the beams. This sort of technology, there's only one of this kind of thing that is built in the world. Um, it costs about $6 billion to build, including doing all of the engineering work. So you don't go building many of these. Um, and it was conceived in the 1980s before the technology for superconducting magnets was even uh, invented. So they basically guessed that over the next 20 years, someone would come up with a solution to these problems and designed the experiments accordingly. 
at four places around this 27 kilometer ring, there are experiments. These detectors are roughly 1,200 tons. They're the size of large cathedrals. And they have basically been modeled as 100 megapixel cameras. So they're huge numbers of sensors. The difference between this and your standard camera that you would have at home is that these take 40 million pictures every second. When you add all that up, 100 megapixels, 40 million pictures a second, you get at data rates that are approaching one petabyte a second. This means we have a data problem to work through. So the kind of things we get out of the accelerator after we've worked on the data is that we have beams of particles, they collide. We start off with protons. When they collide, they produce a shower of fundamental particles. And then from that, we try and work out what went on. It's a bit like coming along to a car accident and trying to work out what the makes of the cars were as they collided. To make things more interesting, we actually send around hundreds of protons at the same time. This means we get hundreds of collisions inside each of the detectors and we then need to work them out and separate them out. This takes serious computing power. And because we just about mastered that one, then what we then do is we send around lead ions. These are hundreds of neutrons and protons, the, the nucleus of the lead atom, and collide those together. And this is the thing that creates the conditions that there were just after the Big Bang. With one petabyte a second coming out of the detectors, that clearly cannot be recorded in any form today. So we have farms of around 2,000 to 3,000 standard servers that filter down each of these events and produce a lower data rate that we can then cope with. So the four experiments, they send in varying data rates towards the central computer center. At the central computer center, we're normally receiving somewhere between five to six gigabytes a second. In peak times, especially with those lead collisions, we get to 25 gigabytes a second. It's pushing a lot of the technologies of networking uh, and equally of storage. In order to analyze all of that data, what we can do at the CERN Computer Center is to record it and, and have a first look at it, but we do not have the computing power at CERN to analyze all of that and work out the necessary information about what the collisions were and what the particles were that were produced. So as part of this, we formed an LHC computing grid. Um, the work was done during the 1990s and has run successfully for the past three years while we've been collecting data. And it consists of the center of CERN called the Tier Zero, 11 sites around that where for each byte of data stored at CERN, there is a byte stored at one of the other 11 centers. This covers us in the event of a disaster at CERN and we ensure the data is protected. And then there are 200 sites around that that are connected to the tier one centers that analyze the data. These are often universities or small labs. With all that, we run about two million jobs every uh, day. So uh, they basically are running through this data as it comes off, trying to work out what is in there that's interesting, and hopefully then writing up papers, and in the ideal case, then going to collect the Nobel Prize uh, in the event of major discoveries. The CERN computer itself, the computer center itself, um, we've got about 10,000 servers, um, 64,000 cores. So it, it's a reasonable size, but nothing that's uh, the size of uh, some of the large installations, the Googles and the Yahoos. Um, however, we're a very open center. Um, this means that we have no reasons commercially to protect what we are doing, and so we are very open in terms of the technologies we use, and we have regular discussions with people. Um, in particular, we've had lots of discussions with Google and Yahoo regarding disk drive uh, reliability. So we see something like 10 times the expected failure rate of disks compared to what the manufacturers expect. And this correlates very closely with what Google and Yahoo are seeing as well. So there are clearly other factors other than the raw reliability of disk drives that affect how often they fail. We have around 2,000 drives failing a year. So that's a lot of times for people to come in and swap things in and out. The CERN Computer Center itself, it's actually a tourist attraction. Uh, 80,000 people a year come through on tours. You can come along to Geneva anytime, book yourself in, and be shown around. Um, recently, we had the Google Streetcar coming around, so that should be uploaded in the next uh, few months, along with the street view of the actual accelerator and the, uh, the experiments. 
As you may notice, we've got very wide aisles. This is to make sure that when we're showing children around, they can't push the power buttons on the back of the machine. You may also notice that the racks aren't very full. This is because the computer center was built in the 1970s for a mainframe and a cray, and this is causing a lot of difficulties in terms of trying to get it so it's efficient for today's uh, servers. The center itself is using about three megawatts. Um, we get electricity pretty cheap because the accelerator uses 120 megawatts, so the amount of electricity that you would see in a small town. Our data problem. So to summarize the data problem, um, we're recording 25 to 35 petabytes every year from the experiments. Um, the scientists want to keep this data for at least 20 years. This means we're facing a fairly substantial data recording problem. We're already at 73, 74 petabytes of data, and we're certainly facing hitting half an exabyte, even if we stay at the current data rates. In 18 months, we're going to double the collision rate and the energy in the experiments, so we'd expect at that point to be doubling our data rate. How do we do it? Um, we use tape. So um, unfortunately with the power constraints and equally uh, with the economy situation, um, we're being paid by the taxpayers. Um, we can't afford to have this data all on disk. However, we have a 10 petabyte disk cache. We store all the recently accessed data and then with that, the other data goes off to tape. We keep the tape robots pretty big, busy, 60 to 70,000 mounts a week. So if you can imagine what you'd do to your VHS tape recorder if you were pulling things in and out at that kind of rate, the drives go wrong often. So we're then faced with a limit of power at the CERN Computer Center, and therefore we're limited in our ability to allow the uh, physicists to solve some of these fundamental problems. So we've been working for a number of years to try and establish an extension of the computer center. Um, this has now been approved uh, 12 months ago, and we will get a new data center in Hungary. Um, so one of the reasons behind distributing the data centers around is the aim of CERN is to share activities around the member states. So therefore having a remote data center in Hungary, even though it'll be a hands-off facility, so there'll just be people swapping disks for us, um, allows us to spread the skills and the usage of the equipment outside of the central facility at CERN. The new facility will be about 2.7 megawatts, so that will mean we'll be able to roughly double the equipment that we have installed. Um, and we're currently installing a 200 gigabit connection between the two data centers, and we're looking to move that to one terabyte, one terabit in the next uh, year or 18 months. So the good news is that we've got a new data center. The bad news uh, is that we get no more people. So we're being asked to run twice as many machines as we were running currently with the same number of guys. This requires that we do a rethink. Um, so what we've had to do is to look at the areas that are currently using resource and try and work out how to optimize those. One of the things that we've found is that we did a lot of work around year 2000, 2002 in tools to manage the data center. Around the time we were leading edge in compute, um, you know, the large centers were growing, but we were still ahead. So we developed a set of tools to manage that. Unfortunately, those tools are now getting very brittle. IPv6 comes along, we need to do all the work. A new operating system level comes along, we need to do all the work. So instead, we chose to pause and say, okay, it's now time to realign ourselves with the tools that are used by everyone else. And this means look, having a good look around the open source community, finding the tools that are useful for us, going through an evaluation cycle, and in particular, trying not to write anything new. We're actually actively discouraging developers to write code, and it's really tough. Because in the end, what we have to do is to say, any time when there is a requirement that is special for CERN, it's almost certainly an incorrect requirement, because there are other people who have to solve this problem too. Occasionally, we'll find there is something special, we will do the development work and then submit it back upstream, and that way everyone benefits. So we've ended up with a classic tool chain structure. Um, I won't go into the details of all of the, the different boxes, but we built in the space of 12 months a tool chain that previously took us eight years to build to the same level of quality. Key elements for us are OpenStack as the control and orchestration area and Puppet as configuration management systems. 
We've actually noticed over the past 12 months as we've been doing this that there are some interesting side effects. The first one of which is it used to be that when someone new joined the organization, they would have to sit down next door to the guru and spend a month learning the magic. Now what they do is they come along and we give them a copy of the book. They go and follow the mailing lists, and if they need any help, they can always ask the community as well as asking the internal staff. So that means we're no longer alone in terms of having to maintain all of this. Equally, they're more than proud to be contributing to the community because they get their names in newsletters and uh, get a certain amount of publicity, which is a lot better than just having their manager in turn saying, thanks a lot, now here's a new task. At the same time, the CERN employment conditions are working on the basis of short-term contracts. So we have contracts of two years and five years. It's very rare that someone gets a long-term contract. Only 10% uh, or so of people end up with a longer-term contract. The aim behind this is that staff from the countries that are contributing to CERN send the people, they get trained up, and then they go back to their home countries rather than remaining at CERN. So we have a positive uh, approach of actually having people ending their contracts. So I think we're probably the only organization here that is actually able to produce experts and be willing to give them to all those people who want to do hiring rather than wanting to retain them ourselves. So when we look out at figures like for OpenStack and Puppet, we see staggering rates of job opportunities there compared to where we had an internal programmer who'd been writing and contributing to one million lines of Perl. So this means that these guys become active on the market and immediately get taken up by organizations such as yourselves. So at the same time as we were doing this rethink, there was also a clear move that said that the mode that we were working in was an out-of-date mode. Um, the grid structure has served us extremely well, and given what we had to solve and the data rates we had to handle, it was the right thing to be doing at the time. However, when we look now at where industry is going, it's very much going towards a cloud model rather than a structured grid. So a lot more random association, a lot more dynamic nature. So we had to go through the operation that says, what do we do in order to get CERN out of a mode where we're doing static machine allocation, static uh, usage of machines, and more into a cloud structure? Around the same time, OpenStack was just starting up. Um, we'd been following it uh, from, from the start. And with that, we saw the possibility to be running at the scale that we needed. And in addition, doing that with a number of other people who had similar sort of problems. So along with the need to make ourselves more dynamic, we also need to make ourselves more efficient. Um, when you wait for a tape to be mounted, it can be up to five minutes before the robot gets there, pulls the tape out the right place, and puts it into the drive, finds the right place on the tape. During this time, the CPU is being wasted. So we're trying to find ways under which we can take the current usage of the CPUs and improve that. Virtualization and the ability to suspend and resume activities gives us exactly that framework. On top of that, our physicists, where we weren't able to give them capacity, just coming up to a conference, they want to get their paper ready. These guys were then going off and getting their credit cards out and buying resources from Amazon. And they couldn't understand why it was that the internal IT department couldn't be as responsive. What they were looking for was a coffee time response. So the ability to basically say, give me 100 virtual machines, walk off, grab a coffee, come back, and have them already spinning up and doing useful work. So we did some calculations of how long it would take if they asked for a physical machine. Now, we're subject to um, European public funding rules, um, and this means that there is a formal process to go through. Based on the summary of this process, in a good day, or a good year to be more precise, we would end up with 280 days between you expressing your requirement before you would get your physical hardware. Now, in reality, what we normally do is we buy machines in bulk, and then you get one of those. But if you want something which we haven't already foreseen, you wait 280 days. That's the good case. The bad case is where you've waited all that time, and we then do a final step, which is the burn-in test. And at that point, we find firmware issues. So we've had cases that have taken over 300 days to solve. We don't pay for the machines until this passed its burn-in test. We've had other cases where we had a disk firmware problem, and this involved replacing 7,000 drives in the machines. Now, we stopped counting the drives in the end, and we just started weighing the pallets. Because you can't handle this sort of volume 
in anything where you're counting the individual units, just the last pallet we put on a weighing machine and then followed it as it went down. It was seven pallets of disk drives that we had to change. At the same time as we've been doing all of this of the infrastructure, we've also been working through with uh, uh, the experiments and application guys. Um, this is a concept that cloud scaling have uh, been talking about. In fact, Randy talked about it this morning as well. And this is separating out workload into pets and cattle. So pets are things you give loving names to. You look after really carefully. And in particular, when they go get ill and they go wrong, you nurse them back to health. Cattle, you give numbers to. And when you get ill, you shoot them and replace them. So what we're looking to do here is to try and find a good model where we encourage our users towards cattle, which is the nice fit on the cloud. However, we have thousands of pets in the computer center, and we're not willing to shoot them all at the moment. It would make us very unpopular and probably stop a lot of the migration. So there we're trying to encourage people to use increasingly standard configuration management techniques. So when the pets do get ill, we're able to recover them and recreate them relatively quickly. So in order to tolerate those pets, which doesn't fit completely naturally into the cloud environment, then we've been working through a number of scenarios. The first is that we have a very old legacy structure to our networking. Um, it isn't structured along the lines of the sort of things you can do now with quantum. And therefore, we've had to do a fair amount of work to make it show that when you get your virtual machine, you get your reverse DNS lookup. You get your Kerberos identity, so you have a valid uh, security ID on the network. We need to make it so that you can configure that machine relatively easily from a list of standard configurations. And in particular, that when there does need to be an intervention, such as changing of a memory chip or something like that, those migrations can be done in a way that's transparent to the person who's asked for the machine. So with the combination of things available in OpenStack, we've been able to configure that. Uh, in particular, KVM and Hyper-V live migration has worked very effectively for us with Gluster as a back-end storage. So where are we at the moment? We're running Essex. Um, we're a Red Hat or a Red Hat rebuild-based uh, environment. Uh, so we use a, a distribution called Scientific Linux. And this is basically just a standard rebuild of Red Hat. And we use the upstream uh, Apple packages. Um, we've had extremely good relations with the Fedora Cloud SIG team that's been doing a lot of the packaging um, and helped participate in a lot of that testing. This has allowed us to take advantage of a lot of the work that's been done to port tools like Cloud Init and uh, the image management tool Oz into our environment. So it's certainly definitely the case that this environment under a Red Hat uh, setup works well. In addition to that, we're currently focusing primarily in the Nova area, Glance, Keystone, Horizon. Swift is interesting for us. Um, we're keeping a very careful eye out on it doing work on testing, but because it requires application code changes on the experiment side, we're holding off a little bit. We want to get Nova, Glance, and Keystone up in place first. Working around with 75 petabytes of data sort of in your pocket means that you don't rapidly move around between different storage technologies. So we're a bit cautious about what we do. The current pre-production environment, so we've got around 150 hypervisors, with 2,000 uh, virtual machines on it. Um, at the moment, they're running a set of programs called LHC at Home. This is a bit like SETI at Home, rather than where you go down to your basement and build your own particle accelerator. Um, and with this, we're able to basically go through a set of build and test environments to validate the environment before we go into production. So this is our typical environment. Um, we're running the LHC at Home under the Boink uh, setup. And we're using classic out-of-the-box um, Horizon. It gives a fairly friendly uh, visual interface for the uh, systems, that, sorry, for the administrators to use. However, we wanted to give something that was easier for the average service manager, the people that are just doing the standard configurations. And for that, we found that the combination of OpenStack with Puppet gave us a lot of power, and then combined that with a tool called the Foreman. And these three together allowed us to be in a process of spinning up a 1,000 virtual machines in three hours by simply pushing a few buttons. <coughs> so with the foreman, what you get is you get the ability to ask for a virtual machine and immediately associate it with a Puppet configuration. And then through cloud in it, that then gets configured and delivered to you as a completely configured virtual machine. This avoids having to do a lot of work maintaining uh, images and allows you to have a lot of flexibility in the configurations you get. 
other things that we found were missing. Um, one, we are very heavy Active Directory users. Um, we have 44,000 user accounts. Um, we've got around 29,000 groups, and we have 200 people arriving and leaving every month. So we don't want to be doing this stuff manually inside of OpenStack. So we sat down and we worked through with the community about how we could get the LDAP functionality of Active Directory available to Keystone. And those patches have now just gone in. Um, they didn't make it into uh, Folsom, but they're coming along soon after. What we're then able to do is basically spin up an OpenStack instance with, there is one small tweak that you have to do to Active Directory at the moment, but this is not a schema change. And so it's something that most of the Active Directory administrators would be happy to do. The details are all on the, uh, the wiki, um, if you search around for Active Directory and OpenStack. In addition to that, we currently have a, a virtualization environment which is based on Hyper-V and SCVMM, System Center Virtual Machine Manager. We're actually very happy with this as far as the server consolidation environment goes. The problem with it is that we needed to scale. And when you look at the limits of what this system can go to, we're a factor of approaching 100 short in order to get to the level that we need to. So with that, what we want to be able to do is to bring in Hyper-V, and this allows us then, firstly, to have an option of hypervisors. Um, we like KVM, but we also want to be able to compare and contrast the environments. Maintaining para-virtualized drivers is hard work. And so having a stack where, for example, we can try out combinations of KVM with Linux, KVM with Windows, and equally Linux on Hyper-V and Windows on Hyper-V, and compare and contrast them is very attractive for us. So since Microsoft has been putting in some effort via various people, um, we've then been working closely with those guys in order to get this up and running. So within our Essex environment, we've actually got a number of hypervisors running Hyper-V, and it runs very, very smoothly. What's nice is we've also got Puppet running on Windows, and with that, we're then able to configure the hypervisors in the same fashion in an automated way. We are doing a little bit of work um, there are some functionalities still missing, in particular access to the console of the virtual machine and linking into the metering. Um, so that work will then be going on along with the people that are working in this area. But the aim is then to get Hyper-V up to a first-class citizen within the framework. So at the same time as we were doing this, we went along to, I think it was the, um, the Essex Summit, and we were asking a few questions, and it turned out that the guy that was sitting next door to us was also from CERN. And he was working on a different project, but hadn't got around to talking to us. And the project he's doing is these farms of 3,000 machines that are doing the filtering from one petabyte down to six or seven gigabytes. They're about 2,000, 3,000 boxes. When the accelerator isn't running, and you know, this isn't the kind of thing you buy from Walmart, it, this is special stuff. Um, when the moon is close to the Earth, you actually have to tune the accelerator to take that into account. When trains go over the top, it disturbs the beam and you have to uh, be careful to keep it aligned. So the accelerator is up and running about 80% of the time, but 20% of the time it's being worked on, being tuned. And during that time, these machines are sitting doing nothing. In addition, next year, we'll be shutting down the accelerator for 18 months in order to upgrade it to twice the energy. Again, in that time, these machines will be doing nothing. So what they're looking to do is to spin up an opportunistic cloud. And this means that they'll sit there, and then when they need to, they will start up the virtual machines, accept work, and then when the accelerator gets back online again, they will then kill off the work, migrate it out, and then turn the trigger into being able to do, and do the job of filtering this, filtering this data down. There are two kinds of jobs they're looking at. One is simulation, which is basically trying to work out what the universe ought to be doing. And then analysis is looking at the data that's coming from the experiment and working out if our theories are correct. They have very different profiles. Um, simulation is very CPU bound. Analysis is largely IO and network bound. So at the same time, from the CERN point of view, we are springing clouds up in various different places. At the same time, lots of other centers amongst those 200 centers around the grid are looking at doing exactly the same thing. So we're finding a need to federate. And this would allow a situation where, in the same way with the grid, you can submit generic workload and find a good place in which that job should be run. To actually be able to submit work, identify a good infrastructure as a service endpoint, and then run the work there. There are two projects we're doing. 
One is internally within the high-energy physics community to get the sites federated together. Um, we're currently running a test with about uh, 15 uh, sites to see if we can get that working. At the same time, the other thing we're doing is with the cloud industry in Europe. Europe hasn't got a very far, highly developed cloud industry. Um, all the big companies are US or uh, Asia-based. So working with the European Union, we've identified a number of companies and we're working with them, the European Space Agency and the European Me Molecular Biology Labs, to try and find a way of using those resources for the purposes of science, but also to allow those resources to be used for other purposes. Some of these are open stack based. Some of these are using Open Nebula, um, which is a very popular uh, cloud solution within the academic community in Europe. You don't often hear about it in the States. And then with this, we're seeing a series of things that are in common. Um, the first is we need to federate identity. You need to have it so that when you're registered as a person in one location, you have access to the uh, resources in another with a reasonable level of trust. We need to find common security policies that allow you to make so that when you want to ban a user for a, because they've been abusing the system, that ban is a universal one across the whole of the cloud. We need to have ways of sharing images. You don't want to be uploading to all of the different endpoints as you're going along. So with these combinations of things and working out how we can federate them together, we're then able to bring these clouds together and provide them as a single resource for the researchers. The combination of technologies Probably, at the moment, the majority of the ones we're looking at are Open Nebula. OpenStack's coming up pretty fast behind that. Um, and there are also a number of proprietary cloud vendors. This is causing us API issues. Um, one of the most frustrating things is the lack of a formal standard in this area. Um, OCCI has been a good established academic standard, but has not received the uh, widespread adoption. Um, although we do have an interface for it on OpenStack and Open Nebula, so it's currently the basis under which a lot of the work is being done. So where do we go from here? Um, we're now at a point where we're seeing the data center in Hungary coming online at the start of 2013. With Folsom being here now, we'll do the Essex to Folsom migration and then start to scale out. So the aim would be to start the deliveries. We're probably looking at about 2,000 additional machines being delivered to Hungary. Um, in 2013, and then start to convert the main CERN computer center, the 10,000 machines there, towards uh, an open stack based environment. We also at the same time looking at an, the number of new things that are coming along. Um, it's actually very difficult for us to just test all the stuff that's being done uh, by the development stream. So the majority of our resources are actually being taken in terms of taking what's coming uh, upstream, validating that solution and getting it working in our environment which is a very productive situation for the long-term uh, maintenance. So Sealometer is one of the things we're looking at, load balancing as a service, getting the X509 certificate management into Keystone so that we're able to use our existing security infrastructure. And the bare metal in the cases where we're not using virtualization. Um, there's certainly still the case where for the database servers, for the servers which are really heavy IO, we're holding off on virtualization. We're aiming for about 90% virtualized. The end target is that by 2015, we'll be running around 15,000 hypervisors. Chances are about 150,000 virtual machines. What we hope is that by that point, we won't be leading edge because there are a number of other people that are also doing this work. And while we're happy to contribute towards the scaling out, we don't want to do it alone. Part of the reason for getting involved in the community is to be able to do it with others. So what are we missing at the moment? A number of things around the documentation and procedures area. Um, we're basically looking for best practices. So we can learn things ourselves. What we'd much rather be doing though is to have good places to go to find the best quality recommendations. Now at the moment what we tend to find is we've got blogs in various different places, but it's really quite difficult to work out high quality blogs and equally to even find them so just finding out the best way of doing monitoring, the best way of doing key performance indicators, disaster recovery. These things are things which can take a lot of searching to identify. At the same time, we have a number of projects which don't correspond to the classic cloud model where you have a project admin and then members. We actually want people to be able to create virtual machines for things like personal desktop. 
and then be able to manage them themselves, but not have it that their colleague in the same project can then stop and start them at will. So we'll certainly be putting a little bit of work in here because it's probably something which is outside the standard scope of the cloud environment and is the kind of thing where we will contribute where we see something which is a reasonable requirement and write up a blueprint for. And then finally, we don't have a credit card. Um, CERN gets the money from the governments of Europe, spends that money, but once that resource is used up, we can't throw more money at it. The, the, the pot is empty. So this means that we are having to be a lot more aggressive in terms of quota management. We need to make it so that important research gets the resources. And the clever guy who's worked ways around the system to get bulk machines isn't able to get more than the amount of resources that he is willing to be given. So this means a hierarchical structure of quota management where we're able to set high level policies of quota and then pass those down through infrastructure as a service. This again is something where we expect to have to do a certain amount of work, although there is already some work being done in the community as well. So in conclusion, um, we've had a production build up that's gone very smoothly. Once we get the Folsom uh, integration in place and our few legacy changes that we need to do patched in, and in particular get them so they're clean, we want to make it so it's not patching the code, but there is a user exit and at that point, we code up to that user exit rather than having to modify the core code. With this, we should be able to go into production early in 2013 on the scale of about 1,000 hypervisors. Moving on from that, then we're looking to expand out into Hungary and then start to really ramp up the production. For us here, community is key. Um, we found it so powerful to be working with other people, sharing problems, and identifying and working together on a common solution. Um, at times, it's been very, very informative for us to have other people's opinions uh, and challenging sort of ideas that we've had. In particular, I'd like to say a special thanks to all the people that are doing packaging, documentation, testing. These are things which aren't very high profile, but they're absolutely vital to a site like us who wants to be able to rely on the community to be delivering high quality uh, product. So when you're there contributing to OpenStack in all of these different ways, then you're basically going to be helping CERN to find out what the universe is made of. So finally, on the subject of collaboration, um, this isn't actually a, a slightly strange experiment, but it is the result of a, a collaboration that we've got going on with Rovio, who are the authors of the Angry Birds software. And they've been doing an education program. One of CERN's objectives is to, to work through the education, uh, especially amongst the schools and uh, universities. So they'll produce a book based around the work being done at CERN that will show the effects of firing angry birds one way around the tunnel and pigs around the other. We don't do this at CERN. <laughs> this is just a simulation. Thanks. Are there any questions? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yes. So um, we're in touch with a number of um, OpenStack uh, research organizations. Um, we're always willing to hear more, and in particular, with it being a very open environment, we're more than happy to be discussing with people about uh, how they're solving their problems. One thing to bear in mind is that we're not a high performance computing site. We don't use GPUs or InfiniBand. We're actually high throughput because what we do is when we get collisions, we just give the results of that collision to virtual machine number one and the next time we give it to virtual machine number two. So it depends on the profile of the, uh, the research organization as to just how much they can share from uh, their experiences and our experiences. But certainly, it's a completely open site. We're more than willing to share what we're doing and equally to benefit from uh, the work of other people. Ah, this is I. So, um, I mean, obviously, in the grid community, they've spent a lot of time dealing with these federated resource management issues. Yes. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of your talk, I started to jot down a bunch of questions about 
what the you know top three pain points might be for you know this kind of enterprise and and moving that to uh, something like an, an on demand uh, or virtualized kind of environment and I think you actually mentioned uh, uh, most of those mm -hmm. uh, but sort of the question is well out of all of the federated identity management and federated resource management machinery that's been built so far that that you're using operationally right now and yeah. I'm, I'm familiar with the you know LHC dashboard and I, I mm -hmm. use you know shots of that in, in a lot of my talks uh, how much of that stuff would actually be um, either reusable or you know that you could graft into uh, any kind right. of open stack implementation because I know that we're talking about federated identity management um, tomorrow but that's you know just one piece of the story in terms of concepts like virtual organizations as being a way of of managing you know these security contexts that cross <coughs> administrative boundaries yeah so basically the question is how much of the existing grid infrastructure can we be using uh, within this environment what things would we not use what things would we use um, so I think there is as we convert in the initial stage what we will be doing is to run the grid on top of the cloud so we will just be providing that as virtual batch resources um, as we go further on we would then be looking to exploit some of the infrastructure of the grid in an environment of a federated cloud so there, it's questions like the certificate uh, environments that we spent long time getting ready, along with the security policies right, and associated right. things. And, and things like the integra we would expect a large amount of that to be convertible to uh, an environment. It took years to get going. Um, it's not something that uh, I see any other better solution for at the moment. Right, right. There and are other areas uh, we would look to be saying, do we need this anymore? And this is in areas like uh, the compute scheduling where clearly with a cloud, it's a very different kind of question. Right, 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 right. Um, I, I, my opinion, the, the soapbox that I get on is that a lot of this stuff is um, you know, orthogonal to you know, on-demand provisioning of resources, and um, I just don't want this community to reinvent a lot of wheels. Right, and, but, but equally, we want to benefit to the maximum level of the inventiveness of this community to avoid that we have to maintain a large amount of specialized code. Right. Um, and that's the sensitivity that we are at in terms of the amount of manpower that is used maintaining it. Uh, hi, Tim. So very much enjoyed your talk as in the previous OpenStack summits. And um, when you showed the pictures of racks with uh, underpopulated servers, yes. have you looked at uh, adding more servers uh, with the over capacity and then using you know, node manager or pstate in the Xeon servers to decide which ones to run at what power and, and always staying within the limit, but having more capacity available which you can orchestrate? Um, we have in some cases done over provisioning. The, the problem that we have is that we actually run at a fairly high utilization um, in that we've always got the simulation workload to uh, keep the machines busy. Um, so this means that we aren't really in the option of basically powering down a set of boxes that we're not using because we are basically spending a lot of time making sure that we use what we've got to the maximum. Um, we've tried water cooling. Um, the problem there is that we've still got an electricity limit even when we solve the cooling problem. Um, and that means that we basically got the choice of saying to the accelerator, uh, I'm sorry, you can't run because we need another megawatt uh, for the computer center. And then in that case, we wouldn't need to be there if the accelerator isn't running. So that's why we've been looking at this uh, external data center as the, the solution to these, these problems. So you didn't mention whether or not you're adopting quantum. I was curious if you were uh, going that route or another. Yes. Um, we have a very conservative network team. Um, so for very understandable reasons. As you can imagine, an environment with 11,000 PhDs um, moving around and a lot of this equipment uh, being fairly uh, unique, um, they are cautious in adopting a lot of the, the, the newer network stuff. They are doing their tests. And at such time as they are happy with some of the underlying technologies and the impacts that would have on the campus, then at that point, we will look at quantum. So does that mean you're using Nova Network right now or something else? So at the moment, this area where we've had to do a large amount of legacy plumbing, we've had to write our own network uh, manager. Okay. So um, we've basically had to take uh, the flat DHCP and then adapt it to produce something that talks to the legacy infrastructure. Okay. The aim is to stop doing that in the future, but we don't want to be holding the project back 
from deployment while we're doing this. As a result of that, we need to do things like wait 15 minutes for a DNS update to propagate around the, uh, the site. Um, and this is the kind of thing which, when we look at a cloud, I want to get rid of. Um, but for the moment, to go forward, we need to trade off a certain amount of effort by writing some specialized network drivers. Very good. Thank you. We have time. Anyway, if anyone wants to get in touch, then you're, you're welcome. My email address has been widely published.